we have a couple of questions, but I sort of tried, uh, I'd like to start with the, uh, some of the points a few of our presenters alluded to, uh, particularly uh, about sample custody and uh, how quickly to get the sample from the collection point to the analysis. And what does that have, how does that, uh, how important is this to the sample integrity? Uh, Marion, if you'd like to uh, get us started. You know, I, it definitely is um, something to keep in mind. Um, I guess that goes back to protocol, you know, some of that just, you know, knowing that there is probably going to be some effect um, as you maybe hold it or not, but if you use it consistently, that's going to help you out. Um, Absolutely. I'd be interested to see what Carl and Mike have, you know, or Mark cool. have, they might have some. Carl, you? Well, uh, I'll be the first to acknowledge that when you pull that manure sample out from the rest of the manure, uh, you change its environment. So it's going to start changing a little different than the manure in the pond is changing. Uh, so that that's a concern, but <clears throat> I guess from my perspective, I'm, it's like my last slide where I had, you know, that perfect sampling is not, it's a, perfect sampling is unachievable, but good sampling is the process of getting better over time. So, you know, that's, I, I guess that's where I would put my focus on is doing the best we can and acknowledge there may be some imperfections that are open for improvements in the future. So, you know, go work. Yeah, well, I'll just, I would just add that our preference is, is to get that re at least refrigerated as soon as possible. Don't leave it laying on the dash of the pickup for a week. And then here we do, uh, uh, most of the samples come into the extension office where they're put in a refrigerator, transported to the lab uh, once a week and uh, up here in Raleigh. So, uh, so yeah, certainly it's, it would be nice to put them on on ice and, or in a, at least in a cooler out of this direct sunlight until you can get them refrigerated. Yeah, well, a, a follow up on that is, uh, it's recommended in Arkansas to call your county office first and say, when's your, when do you expect to be sipping and ma mailing something out? So you may want to keep it in the refrigerator at home uh, for a day before you get it to the county <laughs> office. And when they'll, they'll actually mail it out. We don't, sh we don't have, transportation for it. It's actually mailed to the center to the lab. Just be sure and label it appropriately in, yes. your, in your home refrigerator. Or, or have a specialized refrigerator. And, and that was part of my comment about when you fill the bottles, you know, fill them up half to three quarters full for a half 500 mil bottle is what we use. Because you want to leave some room for hit gas expansion. You don't want the tops to blow out uh, in the post office. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so there, there is uh, one of the points that uh, and one of the questions raised is the statistical analysis or sort of an idea. So variability in all of our presentations today, the variability is the name of the game. So you're sampling, you're trying to add as many samples as you can to reduce the variability uh, to so the question specifically, what what are the typical statistical methods that you're relying on? Uh, in order to either analyze that variability or to reduce that variability in general. Um, so I kind of like to start that a little bit. So some of the, uh, based on personal experience, some of the sampling has to do with um, just increasing the number of samples and seeing how that changes the mean, essentially. So that sort of uh, uh, almost like a, a commodity simulation where you're adding more, you're seeing how you are shifting the mean. Typically, this is how we reach to, to the rules of thumbs that we typically have, eight to 10 samples, and it, it varies species to species. But uh, I'm wondering any of the presenters if they'd like to kind of contribute or comment on this particular aspect of manure sampling. Um, well, I, I, I'll just say from a lagoon liquid standpoint, the, uh, the, the top water is relatively well mixed, and so, it's not difficult for us to get a representative sample simply by walking around the lagoon and, and taking grab samples. But we also were using that same liquid that's being pumped back to the barns to flush the barns. So most of our producers simply collect a sample from the 
pipe as they're pumping water back to the pits. And that's, and plus they're, they are sampling relatively frequently. So they have a long-term data set of lagoon analysis and it really doesn't change significantly. Um, there is some seasonal variabilities, but uh, it's not a tremendous amount. And the way the records are done for their land application, it's essentially a checkbook method. That, so they've got the fields, um, how much will they pump, and then how much the analysis for that. So at the end of the day, when they uh, enter the, all that information in, it comes out with a total plant available nitrogen that's been apply, applied to that field. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with Mark that the top water is fairly uniform and where I have my concerns from a sampling of a holding pond is where is the solids deposition pattern. Because as the manure is discharged into the pond from the pipe, uh, there's a tendency to be right at the end of the pipe, there's kind of a clean area where the flow of water flushes the manure solids away, but then you start getting a solids deposition in that area, and it's kind of a sweep. Then you move farther away from the pond, uh, you'll have the deposition will fall off and the solids level will decrease. Of course, the whole ball game changes the next time they come in and they pump out or they agitate. So that's part of the sampling process when you go around the pond and why I like to use a clear uh, PVC pipe is that gives me an opportunity to visually see that solid step. And also you can tell a lot just by the, the resistance to insertion uh, with the probe as you go in. And on one pond that I've sampled pretty regularly, mm -hmm. I, make it a, I have the advantage of their, uh, one they're got a dock kind of out in it. So it gave me an opportunity to walk out the end of the dock carefully and <laughs> get the samples from there. And that actually happened to be towards the end of where they had a, a solid accumulation typically. Yeah. Well, that's one of the nice things that with that, uh, the survey, the remote control boat, and with and sonar I, in that picture that I showed it you can see that uh, where that sludge is and uh, and where you need to be you gotta guide that sampling yeah from a historical uh, or time trend so to speak and Carl's slide kind of uh, we had a question on this point uh, but also one of the slides you presented on accumulated data between 05 and 2010 yeah. from a lab and I would like to kind of open that question to the, our panel here. And in terms of your observation, uh, so anecdotally, some of the values are changing. Uh, diet changes in uh, genetics. So changes in the manure nutrient values that you are seeing or observing or sort of key takeaways on that front compared to the typical book value that we have established. The, the anecdotal on the poultry side uh, is yeah, there's some changes over time because our poultry industry has gone from rebedding the house completely every after every flock to you may not rebed the house completely if you know it may happen every third year. Uh, so just just the carbon additions in extraction and litter management has changed the manure over time. Uh, on the liquids, uh, I've had several occasions where I would have an integrator a producer raising for an integrator who would come to him and say, Carl, explain why my manure used to be this way and now it's like handling an oatmeal in the <laughs> solids where the only thing we can figure is it was a diet change. Uh, and of course the diet changes are driven by least cost rations as well as nutrient uh, balance. So, yeah. Mark? Uh, and I don't uh, have a lot of data to s support it, but certainly anecdotally, uh, in talking with the folks in the swine industry, the feed rations have changed. And now as folks are starting to clean out lagoons, we are seeing or indications that that's true. And if you, if you just start stripping away layers, you can see higher concentrations of phosphorus, zinc and copper in the, in that sludge. So yes, I think there's, a uh, evidence of that, I think we need to do a better job of quantifying that and Mahmoud and I have talked about how do we do that and setting up some uh, sampling lagoon sludge sampling protocols to kind of to try and address that. Yeah. 
And I, I think the key take home when just this discussion is to just read <coughs> uh, the variability means you really need to be developing a farm specific uh, database of what you're sample of what you're applying and really give some thought in terms of what what are you doing and why are you doing it and what's the best way to do it well and i would say that also reinforces uh some this earlier discussion about sampling beforehand because we've have had some instances where folks have dredged sludge put it out based on what they thought it was going to be and uh, based on their initial sample Turns out what they actually dredged was different than that, and they have over, over applied uh, both phosphorus and copper and zinc in a few a few instances, and to the point that uh, some folks are reluctant, very reluctant to accept sludge application now on uh, fields. Well, uh, I'd like to thank our presenters uh, for for this really informative uh, material on manure sampling.